So since we have a few minutes here before we have to get started, I've got two minutes. Um, I've been pushing you guys to either bring a Bible, printed, you know, very um, Luddite, if you want to go that, go that way. Um, but the other way is to purchase some software for your iPhone. And so I asked a little while ago how many people have smartphones, and almost everybody has a smartphone here, even though you probably use it more for carrying around pictures of the kids or stuff than anything else. But to get some software on your phone is really great. And I was saying uh, there's a couple out there like Uverse or eSword or stuff like this that are free. But really, in the area of software, you, pay f you get what you pay for. And um, the one I recommended was um, by Olive Tree. It's called Bible Study Plus. But I just wanted to, this is the iPad version, so it looks slightly different. You get more room. But if you buy, if you pick up a package of software and then you buy like the ESV Study Bible or the NET Study Bible, what's really nice is that when you're in a section here like uh, Genesis 28 that we're looking at today, and you're looking at something like, oh, let's say down here in verse 10, 10 it says, Jacob left Beersheba. And if you tap on the little note there or something, you can look up definitions for the word. It'll bring up the definition of the word. You can search for cross-references. You can do all sorts of other things. If you have studied Greek or Hebrew, I don't know, there's not many, but uh, some, you can also go over into uh, that side and look up words and do cross comparisons. But what's available on these little smartphones of yours are absolutely amazing. And so take advantage of it, especially if you consider that, you know, this little phone here has 10 times the computing power that NASA had when it put a man on the moon. All of NASA, you know. <laughs> We're not just talking about the, the spacecraft. We're talking about Houston, Mission Control, Florida, all of their listening posts and radar installations, all of NASA combined. I've got 10 times the computing power over here. And I think I have about a, I want to say a thousand times more, but I think it's more like 10 or 100,000 times more memory and storage in this than they had total. You know, so... I, I, love, I love the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks uh, when he's going to the moon because I showed it to my kids and when they had that, that oxygen tank blew out and they lost some power and they had to turn off their little computers in the space command and Tom Hanks gets out a slide rule. <laughs> my kids are like, what's that? <laughs> um, but but it, it's pretty amazing, so really take advantage with what we have going today. Yes, hey, you better be careful because it says I'm the rector today. <laughs> so today we're looking at the story of Jacob, and one of the things that I want to do as we go through the story of Jacob is kind of look at this question of how much did Jacob or Isaac or Abraham know? What, what did they believe? How unique were they from the civilizations and the cultures around them uh, as we go through? And there's lots of clues as we go through the text here about that. The other thing that's interesting about this story and why I'm asking that question is, as believers today, 2,000 years after the cross, when we go back and we read these stories, we think they believe the same things we do. But that may not be the case at all. And so as we go through these stories, this is some of the stuff we want to look at. Uh, and just at the very start here, uh, I've got a picture. This is called the Nine Ladies Stone Circle. This was outside Nottingham where we lived, about a half hour from where we lived. It's uh, behind the trees there. It drops off into a cliff down into the Derwent River Valley. Um, but that's from about 3,500 years ago, this stone circle. And it's the closest purple picture I have personally of standing stones and so that's, that's why I got there but I thought it was kind of cool. So 
The story that um, is the focus of the sermon is God's covenant with... Um, excellent. He gets his phone out and he's looking up the verses right there. You got a good deacon. Um, hopefully. <laughs> or if you, if you saw Obama at the press, uh, he was speaking at some sort of um, high school convention for girls in Washington, D.C., and in the middle, he goes, I see what you're doing down there. I see. He said, I, I got two niche girls. I know. It's like, oh, my God, my dad's talking about this. You know? <laughs> What's up, girl? You know? <laughs> so, um, hopefully it was checking out the Bible <laughs> after I brought attention to you. Yes. All right. So the, what we're backing up is from chapter 28. We've got to go back. Because in chapter 27, this really sets the, the, the reason why Jacob has to go off to Haran, to the household of Laban. And in chapter 27, it talks about how Isaac, towards the end of his life, is going to give a blessing. And he wants to give a blessing. He's got two sons, sons Esau and Jacob. And he wants to give a blessing only to Esau which is rather interesting. And the reason is, is because he likes the stew Esau cooks. Um, and so just as Esau traded his heritage for a porridge of stew that Jacob made, now Isaac wants to give the blessing to uh, Esau just because of his food. And so you kind of get this like father, like son type thing. The other thing that's interesting about the story of Isaac, and we don't have a lot of time to do this, but we'll also get it more if we look at the story of Jacob, is that the wives really come to the forefront in these stories. Um, oftentimes when we read Genesis, we always read it as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Uh, oh yeah, I was going to say your wife was in here somewhere. <laughs> awesome. Um, but... <clears throat> But what's really interesting is in these stories, in some of the stories uh, with Jacob and also with Isaac, um, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah actually play a more pro prominent role than the men do. And it's very easy to understand. I mean, going back to Genesis chapter 4, Eve is the primary mover, not Adam. Um, is that if you're going to have a lineage with offspring being passed on, this, this godly line or this line of the promise being passed on, it requires both men and women being involved in it. And the fact that these women play such prominent roles also really is one of the things that differentiates the, the Genesis stories from a lot of the other Akkadian and Sumeritic and uh, these other stories that were around back then. They were primarily men-based uh, stories, and when women do enter into it, they're very much sort of like items of conquest or conquering or possession or something like that. Um, but with this one, with Isaac, uh, you see that Rebecca is, uh, even the words that she says in the story, uh, the words she uses are a lot like what Abraham says as you read it. Um, Isaac is, is kind of, a, he doesn't do much or say much uh, as we go through the story. But So it comes at the very end. So um, you all know the story where... Um, Isaac is on his deathbed, he's blind, uh, it's getting towards the very end, and the mother, Rebecca, says, you need to, Jacob, you need to go in and take this blessing. You know, I will cook up the food like Esau does, you take it into him. And he says, how can this be? Um, because uh, literally in the Hebrew, it's smooth. Uh, in other words, he's not hairy. And I always like to uh, do this when we're out riding with Kurt is when you're riding along and you hit a really nice piece of uh, asphalt on a road bike you know and it's just like glass you're just drifting along and a lot of times I'll turn over to uh, Kurt and I'll go how can this be for I am a smooth man <laughs> <laughs> but so he asked that and so you know the whole thing they, they put kind of like some furs on his arm and they they drape uh, some animal skins around him so he has kind of the smell and the feel of his brother. Uh, and so in the story here, he goes into his father and he says, My father, Isaac replied, 
um, here I am, which are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me to. Now sit up and eat some of my wild game that you may bless me. But Isaac said, asked his son, how in the world did you find it so quickly? And he says, because the Lord, your God, brought it to me. Now, in this section here, A, we've got the deception. Then we get a lie. Who are you? I'm Esau, the older son. And then we get outright blasphemy. How did this happen? How did you get it so fast? The Lord, your God, brought it to me. And so immediately at the very start here, uh, we know that the Genesis is going to go on. Jacob is going to be the primary character. He's the person who the line's going to come through. But immediately from the very start, we know this guy is a living, thieving, no good blasphemer. I mean, he is just, he is just a scoundrel. Um, and this is one of the things about the biblical stories that's also very interesting is how the main characters are often portrayed in very morally ambiguous terms. So think of any major hero in the Old Testament, and all of them have feet of clay. Uh, You know, Samuel, you look at Samuel, uh, the guy who's going to anoint David as king. This guy was horrible. Um, He was so bad that Israel set up, we don't want any of your family leading us. Period. When you die, it's over. We're getting rid of your family. You guys are that bad. Um, But Jacob's one here also. And so he comes in and he lies to him. Um, And then it goes on. He says, uh, oh, it goes on. uh, He gives the blessing to Jacob. Then Esau comes in. And when they find out about this, that the deception is uncovered, Isaac begins to shake violently and asks, then who else hunted game and brought it to me? And when Esau heard his father's word, he wailed loudly and barely, and he said to his father, Bless me too, my father. But Isaac replied, Your brother came in here deceitfully and took away your blessing. Now, um, one of the things to really bring out in this story is, this story is one of these that just has all sorts of stuff to grab your attention. Uh, If you really read it, you look at it. Will Jacob and Rebekah, his mother, get away with the deception? What happens when Esau finds out? What's going to go on here? Um, We see outrages at a moral level. We see outrages at a theological level. You know, the Lord your God brought me this game. He's lying against God. And it really raises the question of how can God's intention to bless Jacob um, be forwarded by such underhanded tactics? Now, the other thing that we need to realize as we look through this story Um, is that um, one of the problems here that's going on in this story is that Esau has taken two Canaanite women to be his wives. And so you kind of look at that and you go, well, what's the problem with that? Uh, He married some local women. There's no prohibitions against that yet. In fact, the problem that we see with it is, is that these two women cause a lot of problems in the household with Isaac the father and Rebekah the mother. It says that it's a very, very contentious household because of these two women. Uh, But the thing that's interesting about this is how did Isaac get his wife? He didn't send it. No. His father, Abraham, sent his servant back to Haran to get a wife for Isaac. So the question is here, why didn't Isaac, he knows the tradition, he knows what the family line should be doing, why didn't Isaac go and find uh, wives for, e, uh, for Esau and Jacob? And he didn't. And so these kids are getting, you know, they're, well, they're no longer children. Um, and so um, Esau has gone off and, and done this. Um, we also see that um, Isaac really has been providing a lot of leadership in these areas. You see that Rebecca is kind of manipulating, you know, moving the line towards Jacob. And so it's not that Jacob and Rebecca are the only guilty parties in this whole thing. Uh, and then the other fact that um, Isaac is going to bless only one of the two sons. He's going to bless Esau. He's not going to bless Jacob. And so one of the things that we look at this story is, it's real easy to point the figure at Rebecca and Jacob 
and go, they're very underhanded. But you really see a family that's kind of dysfunctional on a lot of different levels here uh, that's going on. Now we move uh, into the whole drama here. Uh, oh, I've got the uh, 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 summary of what I was just talking about right there. Got ahead of myself. So in chapter 28, um, we begin the story that uh, the preaching is about today. It says, So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him, and they commanded him, You must not marry a Canaanite woman. <laughs> Notice, <laughs> he doesn't want any more of this in the household here. Um, but it also appears that he's kind of learned his lesson in this whole thing. He says, Leave immediately for Pate and Aram, go to the household of Bethuel, your mother's father, and find yourself a wife there among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now, from a genetic point of view, and looking at sort of these aristocratic families in, in Europe, we know that this is not a good idea to, you know, uh, take offspring or marry somebody that's related to your mother's brother uh, type thing. Yeah, we don't have time to get into that whole uh, <laughs> drama there. Yes. Uh, verses 3 and 4. May the so sovereign Lord uh, God bless you. May he make you fruitful and give you a multitude of descendants that you will become a large nation. May he give you and your descendants the blessing he gave to Abraham so that you may process, so that you may possess the land God gave to Abram, the land where you have been living as a temporary resident. Um, and so just as in the previous narrative about Abraham, um, we see a, a lot of the same things coming through here. Um, that um, Jacob is going to go off. He's going to be in Exodus for a while, but he's going to come back. That's introduced here. Um, also, the motivation for this blessing seems to be we, we need to let the fa family dynamics settle down here. Esau, your brother, is furious about you stealing the blessing. Um, there's all sorts of things going on, so he needs to go off. The other thing is that he, he realizes that he's made a mistake here, and so we need to kind of go back to the Abrahamic tradition, send off, and you're going to marry somebody from the household of Laban. Um, and so he sends him off. But a lot of these things, you know, that you will inherit the land given to Abraham, that Isaac has now come to realize that it's really through the line of Jacob that this promise is going to go, even though it was done deceitfully, uh, he comes around and brings it to that point. Right. Right, but the problem, with, the problem with that, where they play with you in that whole thing, is that in the actual birth of the two kids, one comes out older, one comes out younger, but the younger one is holding the older one by the heel, and so there's all sorts of things there that the author throws in in the birth process about who actually should have been the first, which son comes out second, these sorts of things. And it also goes back to Genesis chapter 4 that we looked at with Cain and Abel, where the older and the younger, in that case, the older killed the younger. In this case, the younger steals the birthright from the older. And this is a theme that runs throughout the Old Testament are these themes of younger and older brothers that go through, and it comes all the way down to the parable of the prodigal son, that a rich man had two sons, uh, uh, an older son and a younger son, and so when he tells that parable, you need to go back to the Old Testament and look at all these stories of the sons to figure out what's going on there. Um, and so in the parable of the prodigal son, the younger son goes off, but he takes the inheritance with him to a foreign land. In this story, the younger son has to flee, but instead of going off on his own initiative, the father sends him off, and instead of taking the inheritance with him, he really seems to just leave with the shirt on his back uh, type thing. Um, the key thing here that I want to bring out in verses 5 and 7 is that Jacob actually obeys Isaac. First time in three chapters <laughs> that this kid actually does what his father tells him to do and not what his mother tells him to do. Uh, and so they move on. Now, what I want to do is, in order to understand this, is to show you uh, where he goes. And so we'll have a little blue line that's going to pop up on here so you can see the route. 
but he's going to leave the family down here at the very bottom of the map and then head all the way up there into sort of northern Syria. It's actually in Turkey. Haran is actually in Turkey. You can actually go and visit the city of Haran, and they will tell you that this is where Terah and Abraham came from. Uh, they, they still have, now, they're Muslim, and so they think that these are kind of like the grandparents of Jesus, rather than you know, going all the way back, but they've got. But where, I don't want to touch this thing. <laughs> Where Bethel is, is way down towards the bottom there. If you can see Jericho, and just to the left of Jericho is Bethel. And so they're down, the family, Abraham, Isaac and the family is down in the region of Beersheba. And Isaac sets off probably 50 miles, 60 miles to get to Bethel. And there he spends the night, and we have the vision. And then from there, he's going to walk another five to 600 miles up to Haran, where the family is. Probably going to take about two months of walking to get up there. So it gives you an idea of the scope when it just says he went from this household to that household. This is, this is a pretty good, you know, hike that this kid is taking at that time. No. No. Uh, Jacob at, the, at Bethel. So he goes there. Now, um, when he reaches Bethel, he reached a certain place and he decided to camp. And because the sun had gone down, he took one of the stones and placed it near his head and then he fell asleep. And in that dream, he had a dream. Now, this is one of these things where I was asking about what do they believe and what do they know and stuff like that. Because here's a, a picture by R uh, Rivera and it shows his head on the stone there. And that's a typical way that we could, that's one reading of what is taking place here. The other thing is, he could have taken this stone or found the stone and then lied, laid with that stone at his head. And from Akkadian and Uberic texts, we know that they did this for two reasons. One, it was just to protect you at night. In other words, if you've got a big stone there, you know that some weevil or, you know, insect isn't going to come and crawl in your ear and eat your brain out or something. <laughs> yeah. I know, horrible. <laughs> I watched too many Star Trek episodes. <laughs> but, you know, some animal or person isn't going to be able to approach you as easily if you've got some sort of a little bit of protection there on the front end. Um, and so it could just be for protection or wind block or keep the animals or, you know, hide you a little bit. The second thing is, a lot of times they thought that these stones were some sort of way of, in which the gods or the deities communicated with people on the earth. So to find a stone then and lie down beside it is a form of protection because then there's some sort of deity or being within this stone. Um, and so it's a way to protect you at night, kind of like St. Uh, Christopher medal or some people wear a cross for protection or uh, Kurt brought me back a little plaque from Italy of St. Galicio, the patron saint of cyclists, you know. And uh, so it's, it's a way to protect you along those lines. And so this is one of these things that comes across in the text here is why does he do it? And I think it's for those second or third reasons, either protection, this was a common way, in which, something you would do if you're traveling, or it's a way to kind of bring protection, but in a spiritual sense of things. And I think that comes across in the story also because of the language you see that he uses. Right, and the other question is, is Jacob monotheistic or not at this point in time? How many gods do they worship? Yeah, and we're not sure, we don't know in this text, because this is one of the things with progressive revelation, is that God is taking a people and progressively over in time revealing and teaching more and more and more, and we haven't gotten things like the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one, 
uh, and you shall obey him, or I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other God before me. You don't have commandments like this yet coming along. You had too much coffee this morning. <laughs> right, and when Rachel, when they come back, Rachel is going to steal some of the idols from her father's household. So when I was saying, what did they believe? Uh, it's not what we believe. They have a very different worldview than what we do. And so what exactly did Jacob believe? What did he know? The text doesn't tell us a lot, but we see little clues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, everything that we take for assumption about our world is radically different. Um, on um, um, PBS showed it, but it's a program called How We Got to Now, and he traces things. And one of them is light. You know, just how we've used light through the years. In other words, water. Another one is cleanliness. Another one is cold. But the whole thing with light, one of the things that's very interesting... No, not going to go there, sorry. <laughs> Time-wise, we're going to stick with this story here. But it's, it's radically different. Um, um, yeah, enough said about that. <laughs> so he has this dream. The other thing is this dream. Uh, in ancient Akkadian, Akkadian, Sumeritic uh, stories, this idea of dreams is really important. And oftentimes, dreams and revelation from divine beings are hooked up with stones. So there's actually one temple over in uh, modern-day Iraq where they actually had this like area of it where you had all these standing stones. They had like 300 standing stones in this one area. And the archaeologists think that they weren't originally all there. They brought them there. But they are linked up with the priest who built the temple. And every time he had a dream about, oh, we need to do this on the temple, or it needs to look this way, he would set up another standing stone. So he built this fantastic temple, and then the people that followed afterwards went out and collected, they think, collected all these standing stones where he had these ideas about what the temple should look like, and brought them and stood them up in this one location site. So you go to the temple and you can, oh, here's the blueprint for it. You know, you see all these stones. Uh, standing up there. Um, but dreams are one of the things that we see in the earlier text. Uh, Abraham had a dream in chapter 15 about the Lord passing between the animals. You, had lo you have lots about dreams. Uh, and then, uh, as Eric was talking about, uh, in his dream he saw, sees a stairway erected on the earth with his top reaching into the heavens. The angels of God were going up and down uh, it, and the Lord stood at his top or the Lord stood beside it. It's kind of one of these ones where it's a little hard to translate from the Hebrew to the English. But as Eric was talking about, this is where these ziggurats, or these temples with these pyramids, were erected in the ancient Near East. So once again, we kind of see this uh, ancient Near Eastern mythology uh, coming through in the way he sees the vision here. And the stairways or ladders... Um, were one of the ways in which, as Eric was talking about, that the divine made contact with the human being. Now, on the one hand, you would build these, and this would be your temple, because this would be a way for the priest to ascend, make the offering, and then come back down. But it was also a way for the God to descend and be with humanity. And so, um, yeah, in uh, Akkadian mythology, it describes that the messengers of God would use these stairways to pass from one realm to another. Um, it is this mythological stairway that the Babylonians thought to represent in their architecture of the ziggurats. Uh, these have been built to provide a way for the deity to descend and the priest to ascend in worship. Um, the other thing is, because you have a temple on the earth, this is where the God would come down and dwell on the earth. Now this, we're going to look at in a second, becomes significant when um, he comes around to naming the area here. Uh, then he said, uh, Abraham, uh, God says to Abraham in the dream here, he says, I am the Lord your God, 
the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac, I will give you the descendants of the ground on which you are lying. Now, a couple of things here is, A, when we're talking about what do they believe theologically, this is probably one of our best clues. What does Jacob know about God? He's the God of my grandfather. He's the God of my father. Um, now, it doesn't tell you that there are no other gods. It doesn't tell you that he's the only God. This, you know, so you can kind of see it's, it's not real clear theologically what the Godhead is like, but what we do know is that this God has made covenants specifically with my grandfather and my father. There's a specific relationship line here. Um, and then the other thing, I'm going to give you and your descendants the ground on which you are lying. Now, this is one of those going all the way back to chapter 2, actually Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way 4, down. And um, I was talking to the... Yes, we were talking about Hebrew words earlier. Ground. Uh, you'll learn a great Hebrew word here, eretz. Um, anybody hear that today? Especially in Israel? Anybody read newspapers from Israel? <laughs> Okay, the national newspaper of Israel is called Haaretz, the land, uh, the ground. And they go all the way back and they pick up this theme of the ground. Now what's interesting about it is in Genesis, God separates the ground, the Eretz, from the water. Then he tells Abraham, I mean he tells Adam to cultivate the ground, Eretz. He tells Cain, you're going to wander, you're no longer going to harvest the ground, Eretz. Now we come down here and you get kind of it's, it's almost got a little bit of humor or sarcasm. The arrest, the ground on which you are laying. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're just flat out on it. You know, it's not like you're tilling, you're working, you're cultivating or anything like this. You're just, you know, laying on it type here, dude. And he says, your descendants are going to spread like the dust of the earth. That goes back to Genesis 15 with Abraham. He says, look at the dust of the earth. This is what your descendants are going to be like. So there's all these echoes with Abraham and other passages that are going on here. Um, then just like Abraham, he says, all, in the family, all the families of the earth will pronounce a blessing on one another using your name and that of your descendants. As Eric talks about that, this isn't just for Jacob. This is to be a blessing to all the world that goes through here and then at the very end I am with you to protect you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land now remember with Abraham you're going to have this blessing you're going to become a great nation but it's going to take 400 years before you reach that great nation status now Abraham you have this uh, exodus that's foretold in it in this one you get an exodus but it's a much shorter one he's going to go away but he's going to come back in other words Jacob's going to see the, the fulfillment of this. Abraham didn't. It was going to take 400 years for his. No, it's the same Eretz, yeah. Yeah, and this is one of these things uh, um, when you start doing translations um, that there's no one-for-one -one correspondence going across. You know, so Latin uses the word mus, M-U-S, and that can refer to a mouse, where we get the word mouse, but it can also refer to a rat. Uh, and so it kind of depends when it talks about, you know, this. Are we talking about little things scurrying around? You know, if a woman screams, ah, there's a moose in the room, you know. Uh, it would be kind of helpful to know whether I get out the fly swatter or the baseball bat, you know, type thing. Uh, Jacob then wakes up and he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, but I didn't realize it. So when we're talking about the stones, and maybe there's a spiritual aspect to protection of it, you kind of see that coming through here. In other words, he was protecting himself, but when he wakes up, he, he realizes there's something going on here that I don't quite understand, and he was afraid. I mean, imagine having a dream like that. You'd be terrified also. And he said, um, what an awesome place this is. This is nothing else than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And now, uh, in order to understand this, the house of God, the Hebrew there is Bat Elohim. This is the house, Bat Elohim. And a good way to re remember that is when Jesus is going to be born, Mary goes to Bat Laham, and there it's 
Beth, and then Lakem, meaning bread. And so she's got a bun in the oven, and she's going to the house of bread. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, yeah, you laugh, but you'll remember it. <laughs> um, and so when we're talking about this stairway coming down, and the gods would descend, you would build a temple there. Why? Because that's where God would dwell when he came on the earth. You see this same thought process being picked up here that he calls it, he's going to call it Bethlehem. He's going to shorten it down for pronunciation, but it's Bet Elohim. Uh, oh, yeah, Bethel, yeah. Yeah, so Bet Elohim, this phrase, is going to be shortened down to Bethlehem. Uh, Bethel, yes. Uh, thank you. And then in the morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed near his head, and he set it up as a sacred stone, and he poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, although the former name of the town was Lutz. And Jacob made a vow. Um, and so what I've got here is a picture from Biblical Archaeology magazine. In 2001, they have an article on these standing stones. So you can see the stone in the middle there. It's about two and a half, three feet tall. And in, in the article there, um, at that time, uh, archaeologists had found and, and adjudicated these sites, over 140 of these standing stones in southern Israel, the Negev and uh, the mountainous regions there. So this was a, I think it's over 200 now they found these things. It was a very, very prominent thing. And one of the big things that differentiates a, you know, kind of a stone that looks like it's standing from a stone that's actually standing up is that they would have libations poured over it. They would pour oil on the top of the stone. And you kind of go, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. How would they actually know that that takes place? Well, two ways I can tell you that. One, when we were in England, up on Hadrian's Wall, there's an old fortress up there Vindolandia, and they actually had one of these Mithras temples that the Roman soldiers used to worship at. And there, there's a small sort of stone altar there. And I remember when we were in there and we're listening to the guide talking, I just kind of was looking and I touched, you know, you kind of touch this stone. Even this is almost 2,000 years later, the stone is still oily from the libations that got poured off. And the second way is we actually, uh, I was actually in the archaeology lab at UCLA, and Bruce Baumgartner, uh, who's this big archaeologist from Israel, was passing around pieces of old Roman and Greco lamps from around 300 B.C. or stuff like that. And it was really amazing. These things were still oily to this day. And so even though some of these stones out in the sunshine aren't going to feel oily, when they do kind of swabs on them and stuff like that, the residue for that oil is still on the stones. And so they can actually go and they can say, well, this one looks like a standing stone, looks like somebody did it, but we really don't have oil in it. But when they find one that really looks like it was intentionally set up and that it's actually got oil or oil residues on it, then we can see exactly what we see from the text here, that Jacob did a libation, he poured oil on it, and then he set it up just like sort of the culture around his time. The other thing is, oftentimes these things are found in pairs of twos or threes. But this story just has one. But what happens when he comes back? He goes to Bethel and he sets up another one next to this one. So you would have two of them standing up next to each other. And this was a place that people would realize, oh, something spiritual or dramatic happened at this site here. Um, I'm going to close with the story here. You know the whole thing. He goes off. Uh, one of the things that's really fun, I'll throw this in as closing, when he goes off and he actually meets Rachel at the well. So he goes off just like Abraham's servant when he goes to find Isaac a wife, meets the women at the well. Uh, Jacob meets the women at the well, and it talks about how all the shepherds are gathering around because you need all the men there to move the stone. Uh, it's obviously a large stone, and it was set up as a way to make sure that nobody takes more water than somebody else. What's kind of interesting about this whole thing is Jacob sees Rachel, goes crazy, and then moves the stone all by himself. <laughs> um, and and uh, it's, it's just kind of a, a fun little thing, you know. He screams out, he kisses her, he grabs the stone, boom, you know. It's kind of like, you know, what a pretty face will do to a young man is rather incredible. 
But we'll close there for this week, and, and once again, I'll... Uh, oh, another question. What? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's referring, it's definitely an echo back to this text. Yeah, with Nathaniel and Nathaniel's vision. Yeah, yeah. So we'll close here. If you've got questions or anything like that, I'll be over there grabbing some coffee. So thanks for your time. <laughs>